wish you a happy birthday. We wish you a happy birthday. We wish you a happy birthday. So sorry about Green Bay. Happy 50th birthday, Craig. Happy birthday, Craig. Happy, happy birthday. Happy birthday, Craig. Happy birthday, Craig. Happy birthday, Happy 50th birthday, Craig. You old man. Happy birthday, Dad. Happy birthday, Craig. Happy 50th birthday, Craig. Kierkegaard rules. Happy birthday, Craig. Happy birthday, Craig. We hope you've had a great day so far, and we just wanted to take a moment to let you know how much we appreciate you. Thank you so much for being an awesome boss and an even better friend and pastor. Happy 50th. Happy 50th. Yeah, so for an introvert, one of the... Um, quirks we have is not being the center of attention, so that was simultaneously painful, but um, <laughs> also very grateful. I uh, have reflected a lot. Um, you know, last year, my, I was 49 on a Saturday, and um, I got a few text messages, a few Facebook uh, messages, and a call from my mom, um, but I, I thought being 50 on a Sunday, I'm not going to escape this one, uh, but as I've reflected, though, um, you know, it's caused me to reflect being turning 50, and you know, just nothing but gratitude. Just you know, I, I have two families: the biological family, the people whose DNA I have, and the people who have my DNA. And if someone asked me about my family, I would say them. But I would say the second family too, is the the church family. It's just such a blessing. Uh, it's with such gratitude that I'm uh, able to be a pastor here, um, serving alongside you and growing with you, and uh, you know, doing our part to you know make this world better and make people's world forever. Uh, Seriously, one of the great blessings of my life. Uh, many of you I call close friends. Some of you I don't know as well yet, but I look forward to the day where I can call you a close friend. And um, yeah, it's just nothing but gratitude. So thank you for uh, being the church. As far as being a pastor, this gig here is as good as any of them you're going to find, and it's because of you. So I'm grateful for that. Um, yeah, so uh, Super Bowl Sunday, thanks to all of you who brought the soup. I'm guessing we've exceeded our goal of a thousand cans of soup. There's uh, lots of soup back there. Lots of hungry people in Omaha will be uh, fed. I have been told that I have to be done by uh, noon today because uh, someone has a brisket on and they don't want to uh, miss that. Uh, David has a basketball game at 1 o'clock, so you'll be at least done by 1230. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to cover all 50 things I've learned in... Uh, 50 years, and, you know, today is not about me. The church is about one person, and his name's not Craig. His name is Jesus. Um, you know, so as I talk about this, I'm just talking about my experience with the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, you know, I hope what uh, you experience today, I hope what you hear, um, it, it, points us, uh, it points us to the cross. It points us to the empty tomb, you know, so we can... Uh, experience the life that uh, God wants for us when he sent Jesus to the world for us. Um, definitely not going to cover all 50. You can uh, take the list home. It's on my website. It'll be on the church website uh, later tonight. You know, just 50 things. Um, I'm not going to cover them all today. We are going to cover some. I'll just read some. Some I'll, I'll talk about. Number one, though, we'll get started. Uh, freedom in life uh, comes when you can say something like, uh, I'm cool with you not liking me. Um, not everybody has good taste. Uh, so I, I think for a long time I was attached to this belief. Um, you know, if people liked me, if the right people liked me, then I would have value, then I could be happy. Um, you know, and then I realized not everyone's going to like me. Um, you know, it's just the way it is. And, uh, so freedom happens then when we lose our attachments. So like we lose the attachment that we need to be popular, we need to be liked. Um, when we can lose that attachment, only then can, uh, can freedom happen. And what this allows you to do is uh, it gives you freedom to be yourself and not who someone else wants you to be. And that's, uh, that's a powerful thing to learn. It's a powerful thing. 
Number two, uh, make three lists. And I got to this, I'll, I'll talk about how I got to the list in a little bit. Um, make the list, it has three things. Uh, the people you want to spend time with, the things you uh, want to do, and the places you want to go. So I would say back, you know, 2009, 2010-ish, uh, 2011, I was going through something that, you know, a clinical psychologist would call burnout. Um, you know, it's just, it was tough. Like, I just, I didn't have a lot of passion. Um, I don't know what was going on. It, I think it took me about a year into this funk to realize that this was actually something I was experiencing. Um, you know, sometimes I would just uh, do stuff at the last minute. I was getting behind on stuff. I just didn't feel that I was serving the church very well. Um, felt like a failure quite a bit. And it, it took a lot of reflection. It took, you know, some spiritual direction. And it took some you know, good but tough conversations, and yeah, you know, this is where I came up with this list. Like, I, I can't spend the lot, rest of my life as burned out. Y'all deserve better. God deserves better. I deserve better. So I, I said, you know, what what gives me energy? And these are the three things that would you know give most of us energy. Like, write down a list of the people you want to hang out with. Write down uh, a list of the things you want to do, and write down a list of the places you want to go and do these things. Um, you know, so the world's going to try to take energy from us. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be our responsibility, like, just like a, uh, if you have a car that has gas, so if you have electric cars, but even with that, you've got to, like, take it to some kind of filling station. Um, you know, you can't run on empty. And, you know, so I was thinking in the Bible, um, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verse 40, um, you know, here was Martha, I think, that was, you know, dealing with this frustration. And Luke says, but Martha was distracted by uh, the big dinner that she was preparing. And later in the conversation, you, you see a lot of frustration from Martha, and I think the reason why is because she wasn't getting to spend time with the people she wanted to spend time with. She wasn't getting to do the things that she wanted to do, and she wasn't getting to go to the places she wanted to go because she was too busy making this meal. Now, there's a lot of Marthas here this morning. I've been a Martha before. Sometimes I'm still a, a Martha today, and you know, we're not necessarily distracted by a big meal, though some of us could be because uh, behind Thanksgiving, Super Bowl Sunday is the second highest average calorie consumption day for uh, Americans. So, you know, some of you might be uh, distracted by your brisket or your chicken wings or your cheese dip or whatever. Um, but, you know, m most of us would be distracted by, like, worry, um, you know, the stock market, Instagram, decorating our house, Snapchat, uh, the schedule, the to-do list, Facebook, work, whatever. Like, so it's going to be these distractions that keep us from being with the people we want to be with, doing the things we want to do, and going the places that we want to go. All right, number four. Uh, I wrote this on Easter. I think it was back in 2016. Uh, giving into your fears is the easiest way to dismantle your dreams and uh, humiliate your hopes. So uh, I am an introvert. Um, because I'm an introvert, I uh, don't like being the center of attention, but as an introvert, I would also have a a fairly high degree of uh, fear of rejection. You know, so I was thinking later in life, and I deal with it well now, I've, you know, worked on this for decades. Um, but early in life especially, probably, you know, teenage years, in my 20s, probably into my mid-30s, there's a lot of relationships that I wanted to be in that never happened because of the fear of rejection. Like, you know, saying to the buddy, hey, do you want to go play golf? Um, you know, saying to the couple that we're friends with, hey, would you like to come over for dinner? And, you know, it was the fear of rejection that, like, you know, what if they don't like us? What if they don't like me? What if they want to spend time with us? It was that fear of rejection that I think uh, a lot of good relationships in my life never happened. You know, here, fear dismantled the dreams and it humiliated the hopes. Um, sometimes I worship this god. Uh, her name is Safety. Um, so sometimes in my life I've, I've had a fear, a fear of failure. Um, you know, as I look back on my life, it's not the mistakes I made that I regret. It's the, the things I wanted to try that I didn't try um, that I regret. Mistakes, you can, re you can recover from them. Um, you just pick yourself up, you learn, you, you know, try it again, you move on. Um, things you don't try, that, that's not so easy to recover from. You know, that's living in this land of regret. Um, the other one I had was, you know, I, I've had this God of perfectionism in my life and this fear of uh, missing up. You know, sometimes I think of that old Beatles song, um, Eleanor Rigby. Uh, you know, here's Father McKenzie writing the, the words to the sermon that no one will hear. And sometimes I wonder how many times I've, you know, sat in front of my computer making every 
word correct in the letter that goes out to the congregation or the mass email that we send out. And I, I lost probably some really good ordinary moments because of my perfectionism that is rooted in the, in the God of safety, um, in the God of, uh, the God of perfectionism. So one of my favorite Bible verses is found in Joshua uh, chapter 1, verse 9, be strong and courageous. Um, be strong and courageous. Uh, do not be afraid or, or discouraged, for the, the Lord your God is, is with you where, wherever you go. Um, I wish I would have like totally internalized this one and listened to this one and internalized this one a lot earlier in life. All right, number six, uh, you can't change other people. Um, I'm going to pause there. Um, I want you to repeat after me. Uh, I can't change other people. Okay, on the count of three. One, two, three. I can't change other people. Can you change other people? No, other people can't even change themselves. Um, you know, how, how are you supposed to do it? Um, you can't change other people, so hopefully your happiness doesn't rest in that desire. Uh, you can totally change your reaction to the other person, and that one simple change is going to give you some happiness. So, like, take the stranger in the car behind you that is very frustrated with the pace that you're driving. You can't change that person, but you can change your reaction to that person. Um, you don't have to let that person ruin your day. You can just say, okay, this guy, like, he's frustrated for some reason, but um, I'm not going to let that bother me. You can't change him. You can change your reaction. Huge difference. Uh, your boss, this applies to everyone except the 10 people who work here. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> you're not going to change your boss, but if your boss gives you something to do at the last minute that's unreasonable, you can change your reaction to him. If he says he doesn't think you're doing a very good job, you can change your reaction to her. Um, the classmate is giving you trouble. Um, even your, like your spouse, your child, or uh, if your child, your parent. Um, I believe that our households could definitely change. Um, if we just changed our reaction uh, to human beings being human and making some mistakes, saying some things that they wish they wouldn't have said, not saying some things that uh, they wish they wouldn't have said, you know, doing that. I mean, we, we're human. We make mistakes. If we can change our reaction and give people a little bit, a bit of grace, um, you know, our world and their world is going to be a whole lot better. Um, all right, number 11, uh, two people exist in life who you'll never forget. It's not the athlete, the artist, the genius, or the millionaire. They come and go. But the one who authentically and joyfully celebrates with you in times of prosperity and the one who encourages and helps you in your, your darkest hour. Um, now, 20, so there's Super Bowl today, right? So you get the, the Chiefs and the 49ers, and based upon... Uh, all the Kansas City red. It looks like we got more Chiefs fans than 49ers fans here. But regardless of uh, who wins, um, there is not a single one of us here in 20 years that is going to remember the MVP of tonight's game. But there is somebody that you'll remember. Um, you're going to remember that neighbor. Um, you're going to remember that uh, parent of, of one of your friends that went to the dance recital and he sat through like 12 dances and then he got to see you dance for like two minutes and 20 seconds and then, you know, they sat through like eight more dances and they got to watch you dance for like another three minutes and they actually stuck around until it was over and they hugged you and they gave you a five, high five and they told you how good a job you did. Like 20 years from now, you're, you're going to remember that, right? You're also going to remember the person who uh, canceled their plans and they had plans, but... They dropped all their plans when <clears throat> you called them up and told them that the doctor has just called you and you found out that you have cancer. And they come and they sit with you and they don't leave until they're ready to leave. Like you tell them you're fine, they don't leave because they know you're not ready. You remember that person 20 years from now. You really do. Um, the most beautiful human moment in the scriptures that I've ever found um, you can probably find some other ones that are close and maybe some that are better, but this is for me. Um, it's actually between a woman and a woman. Um, so here, uh, Naomi, her uh, two sons have died. This is her pride and joy. It's also her social security program. Um, one of the daughters, or one of the daughter-in-law has left. Um, now, Ruth should have left, uh, but she didn't. Yeah, she's stuck with the woman who is going through, like, her darkest moment, her greatest hour of pain. And 
Ruth says to Naomi, like, these beautiful, sacred words, um, don't ask me to leave you or turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Um, we remember that story thousands of years later um, because it was Ruth who sat with Naomi in Naomi's toughest moments. Now, you've heard me talk about number 12 a lot. Um, you'll hear more sermons about it because it's something we deal with. Uh, comparison is a dangerous acquaintance. Don't compare yourself to others. Uh, compare yourself to who you were yesterday. So we do this. So we live in a culture of comparison. Um, our society right now is structured so that we uh, can easily and frequently compare ourselves to other people. You know, the houses that we live in, the jobs that we have, the relationships that we have, the places we go, the things that we do, our kids, our hobbies. Um, so easy to compare with other people. Now, we don't do a good job of it. Um, because we compare ourselves uh, to who we perceive other people to be, not who they actually are. Because culture actually makes it pretty easy for us to uh, project in many ways um, that we're a lot healthier and happier than we probably actually are. So not only do we do a bad job of comparing, comparing even if we could do a good job is a bad idea. Uh, Paul says, pay careful attention to your own work. Paul doesn't say... Uh, pay careful attention to somebody else's work. He says, pay careful attention to your own work. Uh, for then you'll get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anybody else. So I wish uh, I would have learned this one earlier in life. It took me a long time to stumble upon this one. I remember like early in my career, I was a, a youth minister from 1995 to 2000, and um, two friends, uh, actually I had more than two friends, but... <laughs> These two friends are the ones that make this story. <laughs> so one of them's name was Rob and one was Mike, and these two guys were probably about two of the holiest, godliest, funnest, Beth youth ministers you're ever going to find. Um, so a lot of times our three churches would do things together. Um, these two men could walk into any room, and within a moment they would be the life of a party. You know, the middle school kids, the high school kids, the college kids, the adults, they would flock to these people. And oftentimes I would compare myself, and that's just not who I am as an introvert. Um, you know, it's just not who I am. Like, you know, I mean, I've done a lot of your weddings and your kids' just weddings, and you've been to weddings I've done, and I'll do the wedding, I'll go to the reception, I'll eat the food, I'll pray, I'll listen to the speeches. But when the dancing starts, um, that, that's my cue to leave. Um, <laughs> I'm not the life of the party. Um, plus, my sermon's probably not done, I need to work on it, but... Uh, So then, like, I got to the place finally in life where I just realized, like, I can't compare myself to other people because I'm not other people. I'm never going to be the life of a party. Um, you know, but I'm creative. I can come up with, like, systems and structures that make sense. Um, you know, I, I love to care for people. I love to pray. I love to listen. Like, these are things that I can do well. Um, so don't compare myself to my great friends who can do great things. To compare myself to who I was yesterday. Am I a better listener? Am I coming up with better ideas? Um, you know, am I a, a more caring, compassionate person? That, that I can control and that I can change. Um, number 13, conflict is uh, inevitable in all relationships. Let's take a break real quick, okay? You gotta be totally honest. If you have had a uh, conflict with somebody in the year 2020, raise your hand. Okay, the rest of you, you have a shoulder that's hurt or you're a high introvert. <laughs> Or you're a high introvert as well, and you don't want to, like, stand out. Oh, what do they think of me? And, uh... <laughs> so uh, it's inevitable. That means it's going to happen. Um, and if it's not happening, that means, like, it's happening, you're just not dealing with it. Like, it's impossible for two people to walk around in a dark room and not bump each other. It's impossible for conflict not to happen. Now, here, here's where I want to go with this. So the presence of conflict should not mean the absence of respect. You know, respect between two parties is going to be absolutely essential during conflict. So listen intently, use good words, value, listen to this one, value the other person more than your need to win. Now, I, I've sat across the table before, um, you know, between uh, the table and me and a couple, and or it could be friends, it could be whoever. Like, there are people who have won relationships or won, won an argument but they lost the relationship. So you're alone and you're right. That doesn't do you any good. You know, being together and understanding and 
and valuing and coming to a, a mutual agreement with clear expectations, like that's a win. Um, you know, so Jesus says in his great sermon, do to others whatever you'd like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that's taught in the law of the prophets. Do to others, treat others the same way that you want them to treat you. You know, respect those people you disagree with. All right, number 14 is related. It's about relationships and uh, interpersonal stuff. Uh, don't quarrel with people who are committed to misunderstanding you. Listen to this next line. Uh, don't participate in every argument you're invited to. If you wrestle with a pig, both of you are going to get muddy, and only one of you is going to enjoy it. Um, now, number 13 assumes that both parties are going to play fair. Um, there's going to be respect. There's, uh, there's going to be grace. Now, in, in, in 14, if the second party is not playing fair, if, if they don't want resolution, if they're more concerned with being right than they are concerned with you, if they invite you to that fight, if they invite you to that conflict, you don't have to show up. You, know, you, you don't have to show up. Um, number 19. More than uh, eggs, uh, people are fragile. Handle them with care. Uh, treat them better than your phone or your, your family heirloom. So I don't know if you all knew this. This is my uh, book here, and it kind of looks like a theological book or an old Bible or something. Um, I'll give you a hint. It's, uh, it's actually an iPad. Um, it's an old iPad. I got this in uh, 2012. It's like the iPad 2, I think. Um, now, let's just say I would, like, throw this, and it would hit the concrete, and it would break, and it wouldn't work anymore. Y'all would think that I'm absolutely crazy. Like, why would he do that to, like, something this valuable? Um, now, uh, if we were to ignore a hurting person, if we were to criticize someone who made a mistake, um, if we were to take our frustration out on other people, we consider that to be ter uh, totally normal. You know, there's some of us that trade our possessions better than we trade our people. You know, I don't care if I ever see this iPad again. Um, you know, but I care if I see all of y'all again. You know, we, like, Elizabeth uh, Wurzel, she, she died a couple months ago. She was young, like my age. And uh, isn't it funny? You always say, like, your age is young. Um, <laughs> like, when I was 30, oh, young, like me, I'm 30. And, like, 20 years from now, like, I'll be 70 things I learned in 70 years. And it's a very long sermon at that point. And, uh, uh, so she wrote this book, Prozac Nation. And it's seriously, I've read hundreds of books in my life. And this one's in the top ten. It's... Uh, this woman, she shares her journey with depression, living as a young adult woman in the United States in the 1990s. And one of the things she wrote in this book I'll never forget. Um, she says, you know, some mornings I, I wake up and I wish I could wear a shirt uh, that just had the words handle with care because I'm very fragile. You know, we don't know what people are going through. Um, it could be depression. It could be... Anxiety, it could be, uh, you know, it could be uh, relational dysfunction, it could be debt, um, you know, it could be the death of a loved one, like, we don't know. Everybody's fragile. You know, treat, treat them that way. Number 22, I've discovered, uh, I've discovered the only way to make amazing sausage is to make some bad sausage first, some pretty good sausage next, some very good sausage after that, and some amazing sausage last, and uh, so it is with the rest of life. So uh, the first time I tried to make, so this actually, remember that list of the three things? Um, so I started making sausage, like, right after I created that list. I said, I want to do this. Like, I've always wanted to make sausage. You know, so I got some stuff for Christmas. I bought some stuff. And the first sausage I made was a breakfast sausage. I didn't know you had to put fat in sausage. So, like, it was, you know, I made it, like, way too hot. And, like, the little breakfast sausage, the casings are a lot smaller. So, like, you have to be very clever to handle these. And you're supposed to start on, like, the bigger ones. And... This was a complete disaster. Um, you know, I spent five, six, seven hours creating something that was unedible. Um, but I didn't waste that time because the next time um, I made something that was edible. And the next time I made something that was pretty good. The next time I made something that was pretty darn good. And um, I'm not the best sausage maker in Omaha. Uh, Ken Stoichich down on 24th Street. Uh, he started making sausage when he was 12 years old. You know, I'd probably put Ken in his early 60s now. This guy's been making 
sausage for 40 some odd years. He makes sausage that they sell at the College World Series. Um, this guy is a butcher like that could work circles around me. And why? Because he, he, he's done this for a long time. You're not going to find a better person than him. Um, so, like, you know, last night, we'd, last night me and uh, we made uh, two sausages. Um, so I always make Super Bowl sausage, one for each team. So the Kansas City one is pretty obvious. What do you think the sausage is? Yeah, Kansas City barbecue. Um, now, the San Francisco one was tough. Um, I was like, what do I make, fish sausage? I mean, that just sounds totally gross. And Or do I, do I make vegan sausage? That sounds just as gross. Now, just hold on. Some of you are vegan. I get that. Um, I respect you. I like you. But it still sounds gross to me. Um, <laughs> so I, I love this. Uh, so Jesus is telling a parable. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. A widow that... Uh, that uh, that city, uh, a widow of that city came to him and repeated, um, and she repeated, she didn't ask once, she repeated many times, um, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. Uh, the judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. Um, I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant request. You know, so Jesus goes on and he unpacks this and um, he says her persistence pays off here. You know, so if it's praying, if it's making sausage, if it's being a good mom, um, you know, if it's mastering your skills as a nurse, like whatever it is, like just keep doing it. You know, keep getting better. Number 23, forgive yourself. Um, I wrote this one. God, this was old. This is, I found this one like eight years ago, ten years ago. Do you, do you really want your future to be comprised of watching the video of some of the most painful moments of your life? You know, so forgive. It, it's time to start creating some new videos, some better ones. You know, and um, I, like, a, as a pastor, like, I, I, I've, I've made mistakes. As a pastor, I've um, you know, missed opportunities. I've, I've observed this. I've experienced this with others. Um, now, now, here's the deal. Like, in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, like, I love, I love this verse. Um, but where sin increased, grace increases even more. You know, so, like, there's some of you who are here for the first time today, and I've gotten to meet a couple of you, and... Um, you know, you, you might be beginning your journey or you're looking for a new start or a fresh start. Uh, and as it, your sin increases, God's grace is going to increase even more. You know, there's some of us who have been coming here for a while, and for one reason or another, we don't feel worthy. We don't feel good enough. We feel that our past is just, it, it's been too bad. And like, you know, God can't use someone like us. God can't even love someone like us. And and Paul says that when our sin increases, God's grace increases even more. That, that there is more grace in God than there is sin in us. Um, you know, God has offered. It's our job to accept this grace. It's our job to accept this forgiveness and move on. You don't want to spend the rest of your life watching some really bad movies of the past. You know, create better movies. Accept the forgiveness and move on. All right, number 27. This quote is not mine. It's from... Uh, a theologian, he was a professor at Gustavus Adolphus College in Minnesota. Um, he's a theologian and probably the great theologian on uh, uh, humor. And he says, humor is not the opposite. Uh, humor is um, uh, the opposite of seriousness, not despair. Um, you know, so uh, don't take yourself so seriously. Um, give yourself some grace, have fun, and laugh. You know, so humor... Um, it's the opposite of despair. You know, it's not the opposite of seriousness. So, like, it, it, like just think about this. Like, I had this one guy. He's a, he's a friend of mine. He actually used to live with us for a while. He's an anesthesiologist. Um, he came up to me after church one day, and uh, he says, you know, Craig, I got it figured out. We uh, have different jobs, but we both uh, do the same thing. We put people to sleep. <laughs> he's like, he makes a lot more doing it than I do. And, uh, you know, my wife is a couples therapist, and, you know, even Amber and I have, like, dysfunction, and um, it, it's really tough when you're married to a therapist. Like, she'll say, Craig, uh, when you say this, are you feeling this way, or does this come from your childhood? Um, <laughs> and I'm like, Amber, let's just pray about it, and things will be cool. 
so you know, I've done a lot of the weddings I talked about, and I like to make them personal. And I always ask the couple, like, you know, what is it? Uh, you know, how how do how do y'all meet? So I asked this one couple, and they like looked at each other, and I said, I'll just tell me, I've heard everything. And like, okay, so she uh, got arrested for the third time, drunk driving, and she had to come in and uh, get a bracelet put on her, her uh, ankle, and I'm the guy that puts the bracelet on the ankle, and the rest is history. <laughs> um, so I thought to myself, whatever happened in the old days when people met on Match.com? <laughs> you know, speaking of weddings, this one guy, he said, how much is uh, my daughter's wedding? I said, well, it's $500. And he said, $500 for 30 minutes? And I said, I can talk slower if you want. <laughs> So uh, Job 8.21 says, uh, he will once again fill your mouth with laughter and your, your lips with uh, shouts of joy. You know, some of us have come today and uh, we're like Job. There's, uh, there's a tough place that we're in right now. We've lost something. There's a threat that we're, we're going to lose something. Um, and I love this. Uh, he'll once again fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Humor is a good thing. Uh, number 28, uh, we most look like Jesus when we serve, give, and forgive. Uh, doing these things is a blessing to you, and it's a blessing to others. Do these things. I got nothing to add to that one. Um, number 29, Jesus wasn't interested in standing with those uh, who are great. He had a better plan, sitting with those who are hurting. So be like Jesus. Um, so the Gospel of John, chapter 4, has the longest narrative that's found in the four Gospels. It's the story of Jesus meeting a woman at the well. Um, now here's, a, here's the, I think, probably the best example of Jesus sitting with someone. So Jacob's well was, was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well at, at noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman uh, came to draw water, and, and Jesus said to her, uh, you know, please... Uh, Please give me a drink. Um, now, there's so much in this little thing. Um, so, first of all, a man would not have talked to a woman, not in that culture. Um, a Jew like Jesus would have never talked to a Samaritan. And then there's one more thing that you got to know the history and the culture here. Uh, it was noon. The woman was at the well. She shouldn't have been there. Um, people go to the well early in the morning. They go right before it gets dark because that's when it's coolest. You, know, you don't go in the middle of the day when it's 100 degrees and take the big bucket and get your water unless you're trying to hide from somebody. And, and she is trying to hide from somebody because she was nobody. You know, the story continues uh, that she's had a little bit of a past. And Jesus here, he didn't stand with someone who was great. He sat with someone so that they could be great. You know, he invited her, and through that story, he invited the rest of us to drink from that well that will always quench our thirst. Um, number 30, uh, don't judge somebody by the chapter you walked in on. Um, you don't know what they've been through. Be patient and kind to uh, everybody. So you don't know if they're depressed. You don't know if their marriage is in trouble. Um, you don't know if their parents neglect them. You don't know if they have health problems. I thought about Jesus and Zacchaeus. Uh, Zacchaeus was a tax collector, a bully, a thug. He was this little guy. Um, Jesus invited himself into Zacchaeus' life. Now, what Jesus could have done is Jesus could have judged uh, Zacchaeus for Zacchaeus' profession, but he didn't do that. He went and had dinner with him. And Jesus took some hits on this one. They're like, why are you having dinner with this, uh, with this sinner? Well, the reason why is because he's not going to judge Zacchaeus' story um, by the chapter that he walked in on. Um, you know, maybe Zacchaeus had a tough childhood. Maybe Zacchaeus was forced into this thing. Maybe Zacchaeus uh, is sad and, and lonely. And let's know what Jesus says. Uh, not jumping in the middle of the chapter. He's, he's getting the whole book here. And he, he says, Jesus said to him, um, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too, Zacchaeus, is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and, and save those who were lost. Um, Get the whole story uh, before you make a judgment. And even if you have the whole story, um, judging is not really a good idea anyway. Number 31, you're not, ice, you're not a carton of ice cream. This means that you can't make everybody happy, so stop trying. Um, you won't miss the stress and the disappointment. Um, number 36, don't be like Google. Wait until someone has uh, finished their sentence until you start guessing and suggesting things. <laughs> Listening is a beautiful act of love. Do it better. So every once in a while when 
I have to like know the person and like the person to say this. Uh, so <laughs> sometimes I'll be talking and like someone over talks. Um, so like I'll, I'll say to them, um, "Hey, I, I just wanted to apologize uh, to you." Like, what are you apologizing for? Well, I'm just apologizing that the middle of my sentence has interrupted the start of yours. Uh, <laughs> you know, like. A lot of times, it's like, you know, I mean, li listen, I, I think I said this last week, I think listening is like 80% of uh, the importance of communication. I think talking is like 20%. Um, but most of us are better talkers than we are listeners. Uh, listen better. Uh, number 38, would you rather have uh, cool stories to tell or lots of crap clutter in your closets? Invest in people and experiences, not stuff. Do things that make you forget to check your phone. You know, so last night, Benjamin's home this week. He was at the first service. Uh, they just have, like, one class in January, and then, like, the spring semester starts next week. So uh, I hadn't been able to see him much. I worked all day Thursday. I was out of town working all day Friday. I had a funeral here yesterday and um, had a couple counseling sessions in the morning, so I hadn't really seen him much. Uh, had to finish uh, the notes for this uh, yesterday, at least, like, which ones I was going to talk about. So it was, like, 5 o'clock, and... Um, so Benjamin's gift to me this year is to make the Super Bowl sausage with me. You know, so we uh, went down to the Asian market, and so the, the Korean sausage is uh, a Korean kimchi sausage. Um, so I took uh, kimchi, and I researched, like, what they eat in Korea and blended it in with the pork. And, uh, you know, so we went down to the Asian market and, like, just had so much fun down there. We went back, and we chopped up the meat, and we did the spices, and... Um, mixed all the stuff together, got the casings ready, we stuffed it, and we got done at uh, 3.15 this morning. Um, <laughs> but you know what? Like, uh, yeah, um, if I fall asleep up here, it's not that I'm boring, it's just that I'm tired. Um, <laughs> but 20 years from now, I remember that one. You know, he could have bought me a St. Olaf hoodie, and that would have been cool, and I probably would have wore it for a couple years. Um, he could have, uh, you know, got me this or that, but he gave me an experience, not a, not a possession, because experiences are better than possessions. Um, number 39, I can think of no worse body of water to swim in than the sea of other people's expectations. People drown in that sea every single day. Find your own pond, river, lake, or ocean filled with uh, the waters of authenticity, growth, and grace. Now, here's the deal with relationships. Relationships will fail for one reason. The one reason relationships fail is because one party in that relationship is not having their expectation met. Now, the relationship can functionally end. Um, you can go through the motions and actually still you know, be physically close together, but emotionally a thousand miles apart. Or the relationship can actually just uh, you know, be done and both parties go their separate ways. Um, you know, so here, uh, it's going to be very clear and very important to have clear expectations. Um, you can speak to me this way, but you can't speak to me like this. Um, you can treat me this way, but you can't treat me like that. Um, you know, so to have these tough conversations, like, you know, and to have clear, like, realistic, life-giving, agreed-upon expectations, and then have both parties meet those things. You know, to try to meet these unreasonable, un de the demanding, um, the unclear expectations, you're going to drown in that sea every single time. Um, you know, swim in the, the, the waters of, of clear, healthy, life-giving expectations. Number 41, obstacles and failures happen. Uh, don't quit. Keep going. Life's most challenging roads lead to the most rewarding and beautiful destinations. You know, sometimes if the family's out and about and it's, uh, in the summer, I'll actually come here and work. I love to sit out the tables out there. Um, it's just cool to see it kind of get dark. And I, I love to see uh, kids learning how to ride their bikes. Um, this is like the place in West Omaha. Um, yeah, we didn't know that when we designed the building in the parking lot, but uh, this is like the place to come and learn how to ride your bike. And it's funny, it's also the place to come and learn how to drive your car, and we do try to separate the two. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I remember this little girl fell down one time, and um, I was like, oh, man, there's no way she gets up from this one, and uh, she got up. So uh, she tried again, the dad let her go, and she, she got, got there almost, and she fell down again. I said, there's no way she gets up a third time. Um, and she got up a third time, and all of a sudden she's riding the bike around the parking lot. You can just, like, see her blue eyes sparkling in the sun, the blonde hair that flows in the wind. And she got to this beautiful destination not because she quit, 
but because she continued. Your beautiful destinations in front of you don't come when we could, they come when we continue. Uh, number 44, uh, the point of prayer is not to profit from Christ, but to resemble him. And this one was a big step for me. I remember, uh, it was probably 10, 15 years ago, like, I would still probably, by default, pray the way I was taught to pray, and that's like treating God like Santa Claus. You know, God, I need this, and my mom needs this, and my son needs this, and oh, yeah, but thanks, yeah. Um, but that's not the purpose of prayer. Um, Jesus teaches us how to pray. We pray the prayer every, every uh, week. It's in Matthew chapter 7. Um, you know, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May I resemble you? May I look like you? May I think like you? May I speak like you? May I act like you? Number 45, uh, don't be distracted by your past, your future, your, the news, gossip, worry, whatever uh, you're thinking about. Um, be fully present and fully engaged in the moment with, with others, with yourself, and with God. Now, I notice this one all the time. You can have like two people or four people, and they're within close proximity of each other. You see this in the restaurants, you see this in the parks, you see this in the schools. But emotionally, like, they're a thousand miles apart. You know, so it's not enough to be physically present with someone, to be emotionally, to, to check everything else out and to say, I'm going to be present with you and, and, and with you alone. You know, this is going to be a sacred time for us. The, the, the phone is off. I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. I'm not going to beat myself up over the past. I'm going to be with you fully. Um, so when Jesus, like, was with people, like, you're, you're never going to hear a story while well, Jesus was, uh, you know, thinking about his uh, upcoming death and he was distracted. So, you know, he wasn't much good to Mary and Martha. You don't hear that. Um, you hear that he was all in 100% of the time, all the time. All right, number 48, getting close. Uh, nothing wrong with turning off your phone or canceling plans or doing something you like to do, like making sausage or riding a mountain bike instead of doing something you're expected to do, like... Uh, respond to email or crush your to-do list. It's called self-care. Um, unfortunately, I didn't discover this one. This one discovered me. Uh, you know, so there's going to be times that uh, you can, it, it's okay to disappoint somebody else to take care of yourself because what you're doing is you're bringing a healthier self back into the relationship. You're bringing a healthier self back into the world. Um, you know, Kierkegaard was reading um, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and in his book, uh, The Works of Love, I, I think these are his best words. Um, he said, uh, and don't forget to love yourself. You know, he got that when he read uh, the Great Commandment. You know, you love God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself. Um, but then he read those last two words again, as you love yourself, don't forget to love yourself. All right, number uh, 50, done. Um, so to all of you who are new, um, to all of you who think you're not good enough, to all of us who have made mistakes, to all of us who have failed, um, to all of us who think there's others who are better and more equipped and more apt than us. Um, I read this one last year uh, during one of our Advent sermons, uh, A Pretty Good Christmas, and it says, God chose Joseph over a king, Mary over a celebrity, and, and Jesus over, or uh, Nazareth over Jerusalem. He didn't do the king, he did the carpenter. He didn't do the rock star, he did the teenager. He didn't do the big city, he picked the country town. So God is all, God is saying to all of us nobodies from obscure places, be prepared because he is getting ready to do something great in us and through us. And I really believe that. Um, this is how God does things. God will use average people to do extraordinary things. We've experienced that over the last 15 years here at the Water's Edge, and um, I believe that the next 15 years are even going to be better. I believe it's that way for the churches. I believe it's that way for our families, and I believe it's that way for us as individuals. So let us pray. Almighty God, uh, we come to you, and um, God, I, I pray that this morning pointed people to, to you and to you alone. Lord, this is uh, my journey, but it's, it's the life that you've given me. It's, uh, you know, you're the one that created everything. You're the one that Job says is going to be standing in the end. Um, Lord, I, I pray if someone today came and they needed some comfort, they got that. Uh, I pray if someone 
today need to be challenged. I pray they got that. Lord, I pray that there was, uh, there was hope that was, that was given. I pray that there was joy that people experienced. Um, God, I pray that there was lessons that uh, we learned. And Lord, even more so, I pray that just because of one thing we experienced, one thing we heard, one thing we learned, one thing that resonated with us, I pray that we believe this place is, is different. I pray that we leave this place as better. You know, God, we're going out into the world that has not changed in the last 60 minutes. Um, it's still the same world. But Lord, there, there's hundreds of us who are here this morning. If, if all of us leave a little bit better and a, a little bit different, um, then our city can be a lot different. And our world can be different as well. God, help us to shine light in the darkness. Help us to uh, give hope to uh, the tough situations. Help us to give joy to the discouraged. Um, and Lord, help us to accept your life. Help us to be forgiven and forgiving. Help us to be, uh, help us to be people that uh, do think and speak and act like you, that we resemble you more closely in this world that certainly needs more of you. So, Lord, together we come now and we uh, pray the prayer that Jesus did teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I didn't know you were coming up.